up in the things you are here to see. Whatever you choose for a career path, remember the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you to your purpose. Welcome to So today I have on Charlie Westerman. Um, Charlie is doing some really cool things. He's very into history and philosophy and libertarianism. And I thought that I'd have him on to talk about those things. So welcome to the show. Yeah, Ella, thanks for having me on. It's uh, I'm super pumped to be in Bloom's emergency backup. I love being the, hey. the show's <laughs> plan B so far. You forgot you had a podcast this week. You woke up on Tuesday or Monday, said, oh, I got a podcast to do. Let's, let's get Charlie Westerman on. I hate talking to myself in third person, but I know that's your <laughs> thought. Yeah, you're welcome for being the the emergency emergency slot. Not many people get that opportunity. I agree. I'm honored. I'm so glad. Okay. Anyways, so Charlie, um, tell them what you're doing. Like, what what are the projects that you're working on? What are you super excited about right now? Sure. So the main project I'm working on right now is a twisted history of the United States, which is a history book going from the 1450s to the 1930s. It uses some aspects of social media, which was my idea. I'm co-creating this. The author of this book is my high school history teacher, Gary Richide, the very intelligent Gary Richide, who's absolutely knows this stuff front to back. I'm not like him. I just had this really cool idea one day where I could create fake tweets. <laughs> so it's basically the book is filled with tweets. So George Washington, we can make him look like he tweeted something. We, we make Abraham Lincoln look like he tweeted the Gettysburg Address. And I got with Rich Eyed and I said, I think we should, we should do a book on this because you're, you're super intelligent on this stuff. And the books, we've been working on it for two years. And we just started our Hot Water History podcast where we talk more about current events. And a little more local stuff to Chicago, uh, Chicago suburbs. Also with Christianity, we tie that in as well. But the book's coming out July 4th. I'm super pumped for it. I know we've, uh, we're have we crowdfunding for it right now. We're about two thirds of the way there. Uh, looking to raise $5,500. Got around 37, 3,800. So we're starting our campaign and looking to promote this thing. So it comes out July 4th and y'all are currently... Um raising money for the, for the publishing and what else? Yeah. So we've got our, uh, mo it's mostly publishing, mostly promoting, but we hired, neither of us know anything about publishing. So we wanted to see who's committed to this book, who wants to help us out. We were able to hire our self-publisher already. Shout out to bookmaker Brett. Bookmaker Brett's doing a great job right now. And we're, we're really hammering out all of the, the final details and hoping to get this in people's hands by July 4th. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm super ecstatic for people to read this and get back to me about how much their, their worldview has changed. Because I know my worldview changed after having Gary Richard as an American history teacher. And I think now that people get to read his book and now that he's even, he's even more scalable now that he's not in a classroom, I think it's going to be really special what happens this next year. Okay, so... I'll have to ask him one day eventually about his not in a classroom story, because I, I imagine that he can do that more justice than you can. Yeah, he can. That's very well documented. He talks about it a little bit on his, on his website, but I, I don't want to say yeah. anything that, um, that is untrue, but exactly. I think, okay. I think yeah. he's the right person to ask about that. Yes, definitely. We'll ask him something about that. Okay, so let's jump into this this idea of history as something that we grow up understanding as objective and you having Gary as a teacher and you recognizing that a couple of the things that you learned that were, you know, completely true might not have been. What was that like? Yeah, so just finding out stuff about, you know, the, I, the example I was using was the the internment camps in during World War II with FDR, uh, with the Japanese American people, you know, when, once I read something like that, and there's so many things that are in this swept book, under the rug, it, swept under the rug, 
but also you get a feeling of, wow, I just found that out. And the second part of that is, wow, I shouldn't have just found that out. You know, th- this should have been, this should have been expressed to me a little earlier. And that's, that's what basically almost you, you had a couple of those moments every week with, with Rich Eyed in, in class is just these absolutely mind blowing, you know, we call them anyone who's watched the matrix that the, the red pill, that, that, that analogy is a little played out, but that's truly what it is. That's awesome. Um, I have had some of my fair share of, I have had my fair share of, of those moments where something clicks in your mind and it, it, your eyes open and it's like, you've seen the world in an entirely new way. And you're like, Whoa, that changes opens, everything. Yeah, it's crazy. It completely opens you up and it just shifts the way you, you see everything afterwards. So this yeah. is not for, you, you might need a glass of water while drinking this book because it's while drinking this book. Yeah. It, it's, it's some tough pills to swallow. Did I say while, did I say while drinking this book? All right. My bad. While reading this book. That's hilarious. Okay. Um, so, okay. So let's, let's talk about history and how to find truth. So I imagine that Gary's pretty good with his, you know, going through history and reading it and understanding truth. Um, what are some takeaways that you have had from having him as a teacher and having him as somebody that you look up to for, really deciphering what is true and false in this world. Yeah. So he does a great job of this. I wanted to shout out our podcast as well too, hot water history. Cause we dive, dive pretty deep into this stuff. And he talks about how we're made to wonder as human beings, we're made to question the, the surroundings that we've been handed in a sense. And we want to make sense of this existence. And history allows us to do that. It's the study of being a person when done well. It's the study of, um, it's the study of, and I want to come up with something good for this, but I'm not going to right now. It's the study. (laughs) I think it's the study of being alive. I think history, you have to investigate the past to have some knowledge of the present and prediction, be able to predict the future. And history is, history does that. Yes. Mic drop. You said two things that were like, wow, okay, that's awesome. Uh, The first was, it's the study of being a person. And that's actually one of my favorite topics. Just what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to live well? What does it mean to live at all? Um, And yeah, and, and I think that that's really important. Just like exploring this idea of what does it mean to flourish, right? And, 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 I want to touch on that in a second, but you also sure. said we're made to wonder. And just a clarification, is it wonder with an A or wonder with an O or both? I guess it could be either. But yeah, I, I, I think meant, both are pretty good. I meant I meant wonder. We were meant to to investigate our surroundings to see what this whole thing's about because we're all trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. How have you learned to figure it out? Like throughout through the lens of history because that's not a lens that I have studied deeply I like history I think it's a great tool um it's really really fascinating to me but I'm much more on the philosophy side of things so how have you I guess expanded your own perception of the world that you live in throughout history sure so I have this t-shirt that I sometimes wear on the podcast it's called or it reads if the news is fake how much of history is fake too And that's one thing that you really learn throughout history is when you're in school, you sort of get, you're not really getting multiple arguments at the same time. So you'll have one teacher for the whole year and you sort of know, especially if you know where they stand ideologically. And Gary was very good at not only were his positions, a lot of his positions were so unpopular to me (laughs) that it was like, Oh my gosh. It was like everything. Oh, so everything is, is off here. So you're, this is awesome. you're arguing against, you're arguing against my entire life. Yep. And just something like, even something like the, the federal reserve and the, the fact that the income tax wasn't even really a thing until the civil war. And then 1913, 
it's like we've had more, more we've almost had more years i haven't even done the math on this yet but we've had almost as many years of having no income tax as we've had with an income tax but we've all been so so programmed to believe you know how are we going to pay for being able to live in a society without having an income tax yeah there are a lot of ways that so i was always kind of skeptical of the 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 verbiage programming and then i had somebody explain it to me deeply just this idea of like if you have a child and you you know you hit their hand every time they do something like you can legitimately program them to stop doing the thing um and it's really really fascinating to understand that there are a lot of ways that we act that are not natural like natural in the sense that if you were born in another time, if you were born in another place, you would have acted the same way. So you're doubtful on the, you're doubtful on the idea of programming? No, not anymore. I think it's, I used to be though. Okay. Because I think so much of our decisions are all subconscious. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them are, most of them are just us going on about, think about all the habits you have, like the habits that you grow, that you get accustomed that, yep. to you're not you're not having deep conversations about whether I should do this or not mm-hmm. you just at a certain point you just do it mm-hmm. and there's no I don't see any reason why the same can't be said about our thoughts or our beliefs yes or even like um this was an interesting mind melt moment for me but the whole genetic thing you you grow up believing that you are a certain way because you have to be that certain way but then then if you really think about it you understand that you you know, you clean your house every Sunday. Why? Not because of genetics, not be, just because you, your family always clean their house or, you know, they tell you to marry as somebody that's like, you know, your family. That's just because it's habitual, right? If you get right. up at a certain time, it's just habitual. It has nothing to do with anything other than habits. And that's so fascinating to me. Agreed. Okay. Well, first, do you have any further thoughts on the programming thing? Because I don't think I explained it well, but if you can explain the No, whole... you, you explained it. I, I feel like I explained it to the best as I, I, I don't think it's okay, perfect. that deep. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so let's talk about, I mean, if we really want to go here, Christianity. Do you feel at all that Christianity has been programmed into you? Ooh, that's a great question that's a great question what do you okay so in this sense what do you mean programmed so the, my answer my short answer is yes mm-hmm. my long answer is even though i believe it's been programmed into me from a very young age i believe consciously or as consciously as possible because you never know you never really have an idea of how much is conscious and how much is subconscious but I believe as I've grown into uh, an adult and as someone who's questioned their beliefs as much as I have, I believe that the programming at this point is, is conscious, is that I, I believe it to be true consciously, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. What You said that you, you questioned it a lot. What was the inciting moment of like, okay, yeah, no, I do believe in this? I love that question too. So it's, it's been a long road. I I really started taking it seriously. I think honestly, when I started this book, cause Rich Eyed's great on Christianity as well. And he's always someone you could talk to about, about that stuff. Jordan Peterson, when he was, when he was hot, yep. that was uh, a huge eye opener for me when, cause I, I'm someone who I'd consider myself I'd consider myself to be pretty disagreeable. I'm not like a, <laughs> like a real, real pushover type. And when Jordan Peterson came out and he was just, and, and this is something that I think so many guys need to hear, especially now when he just comes out and he says, no, actually don't be a pushover. Don't be soft. You know, the part of you that the part of you, that's actually a tough guy when that's under control, that's actually divine. And I, I thought that was, <laughs> I thought that was exactly what I needed to hear. You're like, yes, and, that is it. That is, that is what I want. Cause the thing is That's like, awesome. and this happens all the time. And I, I'm actually super pumped. We got into this cause I've, I've really wanted to express this, but I, I grew up in an, in an area where if you 
argue with someone or if you, let's say you criticize them, mm-hmm. a lot of times people might come back and say, you're not acting Christian right now. You're not acting, Ooh. you're not acting as Christ right now. Like mm-hmm. people, a lot, a lot of people's vision, especially with the modern Christianity is that Jesus was this pussy and he was, and he wasn't, you watch, you read the gospels, you read the <laughs> gospels and this guy was a massive shit talker. I want everyone to read the gospels and, and just imagine Jesus being like the kid that stands up in class and was just like, no teacher, I think you're wrong. Cause that's basically what he was doing. I think I, once I actually, that's another thing. So many people don't actually read the gospels. It, they just, you know, there's that, there's the old adage. There's five books in Christianity. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the Christian. And most people don't listen to the first four. I think that's, that's so true. And the Jordan Peterson thing was one. I talked about how Jesus, not this pushover guy. And then the third one was Jerry Boyer's The Maker versus The Takers. That book, everyone should read yesterday because it completely, <laughs> it completely debunks the myth that Jesus was this guy who knew nothing about economics. And this is another thing. It's, oh, you make, you make a ton of money. You're not acting like Christ. Why do you have, why do you have all this money? Because Jesus criticized, Jesus realized, and this is true, that there's different ways of wealth attainment. He did not hate free markets. He did not hate capitalism. His dad as a carpenter was working in some of the, the wealthy cities and city states nearby. He did he he knew the difference between wealth that was gained voluntarily and wealth that was stolen from people. And when you when the, you're opened up to that fact, that's that's where it really opened up for me. Those three things right there are I'm I'm all in now. I think it's also the the I don't know if this is Buddhist or if this is Stoic or both, um, but I, I think that it's in line with Christianity and that Jesus was very adamant about not being controlled by anything. Like he didn't want, you know, a rich man to not be able to get, give away his money. Why? Because it was something that he tied his own worth to. Like that's not something that, that was accurate. Like that's not real. That's not good. And so I think that that's where we get the idea of, you know, Jesus didn't want you to have money. Um, I think the interesting point that you bring up with that is what are the responsibilities whenever you have money though? And what are the, re- like, I guess this actually brings up the idea of character. And and I imagine that you have a lot to say on this because Jordan Peterson is a big character fan. Um, but like, I think at the heart of it, it is all character. It's It's the depth. It's the, who are you and who do you want to be? And how do you align yourself with what is good and how do you decide what is good? So my question in that, because that was jam packed with a lot of big topics is um, if you break down your understanding of Christianity, what is at the heart of it for you? Well, the heart of it for me is to, to carry your cross, whatever that may be. I know that doesn't really have to do with money, but the idea that. Ah, uh, interesting. So I, I, and I've had this, I've had this belief for a little while. A lot of people, when they jump into to the, the most famous, I think the most famous philosophical question is, you know, why do good things or why do bad things happen to good people? And people, you can think about that for the rest of your life. But I believe that the better question to ask is, well, isn't it better that the bad things are happening to the good people? What happens when bad things happen to bad people because when bad things happen to bad people really bad things happen that's why that's okay, why explain we explain that we, a little bit deeper sure so when you get into so we all go through we all go through bad things mm-hmm. but i believe that the test to see if we are a good person or if we are a bad person is how we handle those bad things it's how we handle the cross is do we do we get up and do we carry our lives out and live with a purpose or are we going to become, you know, take like the Columbine shooters. Um, Those are, those are bad, bad things happening to bad people right there. Those guys, they, those guys had 
terrible, terrible things happen to them. But afterwards, no, like during their lives up to that moment, I'm saying they didn't know how to handle the bad things happening to them during their life. And when, when bad things happen to bad people, it's a disaster. And that's why, and this is what Jordan Pearson gets into. You shouldn't ask for, I don't think you should ask for a, a life of ease. I think you should ask for the strength to live a life of purposeful hardship of meaning. I don't disagree with that at all. I want to clarify though, on the other thing. So do you think, when did these people turn bad? Like, I don't know, but I I don't know that. I don't know that point, but that stuff's kind of relative, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I'm just confused as to the, the whole bad things happen to bad people. Like, are, do you mean like whenever bad things? So it's better if you had, if you had to choose between two people and one of them's good and one of them's bad, and you had one bad thing and you had to drop it on either one, you would want to drop that bad thing onto the good person. Okay. I wouldn't disagree, but do you think that's how it works? Where it's like a God's like, or I don't, I don't know like, if it's like that. Hey, I got something bad. No, I, I <laughs> let me, let me I, drop I'm it on just, somebody. No, I'm, I'm trying to make a broad <laughs> point there about, you know, carrying your cross, but I don't think it's like a, a negotiation at the top. No. Okay. I would, I, I wouldn't disagree. Um, I, I fully agree with your whole carrying your cross thing. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot because so I've been in this in this influx period where I'm trying to prove Christianity to myself, um, completely open to being proven wrong and completely not choosing a side, aware of the fact that there are biases in me. Like there are ways that I I deeply understand the Catholic faith. Why? Because I grew up Catholic. So I, I understand it well. And that helps me in some senses because that means that whenever I want to question something or whenever I want a deeper answer, that's, that's a big answer for me. Like, and I could probably find a big answer somewhere else, but I was thinking about this a lot because there was this point whenever I was kind of comparing people. Um, I like to look at the effects, right? Like what are the philosophies that people have and what are the outputs of those philosophies? Like, is it a good output? Does, what, and what does that mean? Because usually you find that the way that somebody views the world, their philosophy, their ideal, their ideal is a certain thing. And the way that we make choices is highly reflective of our philosophy. It's called sense of life. The way that we we make choices and the way that we interpret and take, I guess, the world. And so it's really, really interesting um, because Christians are interestingly deep. Not all of them. Not all of them at all. But some of them are very, very deep and it has to do with the willingness to suffer. And I know that, um, I know that there are people that say that, you know, you don't have to suffer and I don't disagree with that. I disagree with that. I I don't, I don't know. I think that you can reframe a lot of things so that it doesn't seem like a suffering thing. You can reframe, you know, like what's a good example. What would an example of, of good suffering be to you? Working out. Okay, but I could, I could, like, I don't see that as suffering, though. Why not? Because it's fun. Not, not every day. Oh my gosh, yes. You, you want to work out every day? You wake up every day and you, even if you do it, I'm not saying you don't do it. Okay. I'm saying in, even within the workout, you get to a point where I want to get out of here. You know, you get to, you get to the 24th mile of the, of the marathon. You're like. I'm out. I don't want to do this. There's something, there's something that forces you to grow as a person. I believe that's deep down there when we suffer. And I think that's the, I think that's where we gain our, our wisdom is through that suffering. Yeah. So I was, so this is really fascinating to me, this whole concept of suffering. And I I think the only person to answer all of these questions and to really understand this topic in particular is Jordan Peterson, because like, this is his thing. Um, I don't know. I think I'm doing pretty good. No, I think you're doing fantastic. You're like, you're like, (laughs) I've taken in so many of his things. You're like, I can, I can give you fake Jordan Peterson for a minute. Yeah. Right. Turn on your Jordan Peterson for me, Charlie. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, anyways, so 
Uh, so for for example, there's this uh, there's this woman that I knew, and she was just going through hell because of her her family situation, and like I was talking to her, and I could just I don't know, I could feel how sad she was and how much it hurt her, and yet she just kind of looked at me and was like, smiled, and then said something about Jesus, and I was like, damn just damn like that's that's not normal and the fact that jesus like even even the symbolic jesus uh, allows people to do that yeah i agree and that's another thing with the good thing uh good people versus bad people is it's all relative so you are right you know you don't know what's a what is necessarily a good thing or a bad thing at the time that it happens you know there's been some I'm sure there's been some, there's been some parts of people's lives that are absolutely tragic, but a lot of good came out of it. And the same can be said about the opposite end of that. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really, once I, once again, we're speaking really generally when we talk about good things, bad things, good people, bad people, I was more so making my points about the carrying your cross and Mm -hmm. that i believe like the example you just said that's a good person right there that's a really they've they've taken on a lot they're carrying their cross right now and they're they're inspiring others you're bringing this up on a podcast and that's a super inspirational episode i believe that's the cross right there yeah so okay so so then you have this understanding of you know, carry your crosses. Like if you're in, if you're in a situation where it sucks. Okay. Caveat though, slight devil's advocate. I don't know if that's the right word to use right now, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, on the other hand, I have seen way too many Christians take up a cross that did not belong to them. Like, they're like, I, I need to suffer through this. And I'm like, no, you don't just like, it's like, it's like you're on a straight line. You're on a path that just does not suit you. And there's a parallel path and you could just step off and go to the other one. And you're like, no, but this is what Jesus wants me to do. And I'm like, how? Can you give me an example of that? I'm not sure what you mean. So someone purposely going the hard way. Is that what you mean? Yes. And I don't know if that's a bad thing per se. Like, I, I think, I, I don't know. I I just don't, I'm trying to think of an example of where that'd be the case, but I I can't think of any. Okay. An example. Um, Oh, okay. Actually, this is the right way to go with this. Fasting and giving certain things up whenever you shouldn't. Like I, I used to get into this, into this like mental battle of like, does this make me wrong to do this? Or does this make me wrong to do this? And I think that there's such a, um, a tie towards good and wrong and, and, it becomes very, very hazy, the line between, am I doing a good thing or am I not, right? Like fasting, for example, if I eat, if I eat meat on Lent, if I eat meat on a Friday in Lent, okay, I, I sat with myself for like 45 minutes, just thinking through, trying to logically get to a point where I'm like, I don't even know if I fully believe in this stuff, but I know that this is set. And if this is true, then X, Y, Z. The problem that I have is that there's so much tied into this idea of this is good and this is bad. You, because you are intelligent or like you are a mentally acute, I don't know what what a good word for it would be, human person, you can make that call. You can say suffering is actually good for me as a person because it makes me better and it, it gets me to the end that I actually want to get to. And that's but why that's you not within natural law. You you keep switching. No, natural that's law. fine. Okay. Yes, I agree. Okay, I, I see. I see the disconnect. So I think that there is. So this is what this is. Yes. Okay. I think what is objectively correct is written into natural law. Do we agree? Do like what is natural law? Do do we need to go there? Yes. Potentially. Okay. Yeah. Natural law is the laws written into the universe. Something is like good and something is bad. And and what I mean by that is whenever you do something, it has negative consequences already built into it. The non-aggression principle is natural law. I know, I know where the Catholic church stands, but I don't know if it's 
objective what the Catholic Church says because it's not written into something like a natural law. And so then the Catholic Church has defined its its morality and immorality, and it's possible historically that that came directly from Jesus, and that's what we believe. I'm questioning that. I'm questioning the the dogma, the precepts, the the laws of the church. And but I'm saying, why does it have to be backed into natural law when it could be backed into better reasoning than just our natural state as Catholics? Not or natural state as humans, sorry. Yeah. Not yeah. to not to and I, I believe that Catholicism is aligned heavily with natural law, but I, I do see parts where it sways, but I don't necessarily think those parts are bad. I probably don't either. I don't disagree with Catholicism. I just entertain a lot of thoughts. Um so the thing with this is having sex with multiple women, having, you know, 10, 20 wives, it's societally accepted or denied. In our society right now, it's not. But th this is the thing that you keep getting hung up on. Like the yes. church is outside of society. That's, That's what point. you believe, but that is not objectively like, like I need, I need that point. I don't understand that point within how it's rooted. Other than Peter said that's that's it that's it the collection of the collection of saints the collection of priests and popes they came up with that and I believe that to be true why and that's tough to I, I know that's tough to grasp but it's only tough I used to believe it I, I don't I don't disbelieve it entirely but I I question it more now than I ever did Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to convince you overnight, but the, uh, I'm trying to think. You can think on this. Yeah, like I said, this is something that Gary talks about too. Like some of this is Catholic dogma. Like you're not going to, you're not going to sway someone I know. on that. You're not going to. But I think that, I think that even Catholic dogma, like, there's got to be some way there, there is some way if something is true, there are ways to come to it from many different angles. So if I say, I don't know if I agree with the dogma and then I, you know, do a ton of research and really, really, really deeply understand certain things and then come to it and say, okay, now it makes sense. That's what I'm looking for. The, the, now it makes sense. Okay. But this is the problem. And this is such that this is completely the issue with modern Christianity is people come up with their own versions of it yes. and they end up worshiping themselves. That's all yes. it is. Is people worshiping people are worshiping themselves when they come to this. So it's better to be within the church and argue within the church than it is to um and to disagree within the church. It's not like it's not like Gary and I are on board with every priest, every bishop, absolutely not. Um but the roots of Catholicism, we still believe to be true. And that's not, a, I know that's that last part's not a great answer, but I, like I said, I believe it's better to be within and to disagree than to come up with your own version of something that's completely different and end up worshiping that, which is just worshiping yourself. I do not disagree. I think it honestly goes back to the whole So I'm, I'm huge on, like, God is truth. That is what the Catholic Church teaches. He's, he is truth, right? Like, it's not God is found in truth. God, God is truth. So I don't think that even if you go to a Muslim country, even if you're in, you know, Arabia, where it doesn't matter where you are, if you can still find God through what you have available there, that is truth. Like, and I think that that's what I'm looking for is, is the whole, I don't know if you could entirely say that every single piece of Catholic dogma is able to be found everywhere. And maybe that's like, oh, I, that's I know for that, sure true. that's for sure true. Yeah. And I know that the Catholics, I know that, like I said, like I, I understand Catholicism pretty well, but obviously there's still areas that I need to improve. Um, 
what I don't think is fair is for Catholics to say you are lucky because you were born into this true religion. And I'm like, why was I so lucky? You know, why are the Muslims in their religion? Why, why, why are the, you know, why do all of these different people, why are they unlucky to be born in their religion? Like, I don't, I, it doesn't make sense. I think my answer to that would be, like you said, the, the Catholic church or more so, I guess, speaking more broadly, the Christian faith is more closely tied into truth revealed to us through our lives than the other religions are. What do you mean by that? Take something that it's, it, this is a very much like the path to Christianity, the idea that you carry your cross and you live your life with purpose in is more real to he, the human experience than some other religion it's it's more aligned with who we naturally are so why why does the catholic church do that better than any other christian i i think so i'll think answer the catholic a part church of my does it better than every christian because the catholic church puts the most um, the catholic church puts the most emphasis on the tradition than yes. any of the other christian faiths and that's always been interesting to me, this idea of, like, I know that some people argue against the hierarchy, but the hierarchy, like, I definitely have some some qualms with, with certain aspects of it. But the reason that we have a consistent Christian c Catholic faith is because of the Catholic hierarchy. Like, no matter how how dumb it got in something like the Renaissance, no matter how... It, the Catholic Church probably saved Christianity. I know. I, and I think that's really, really fascinating to me. I think that for my for my own understanding of things, and maybe this is just my bias, but the Catholic Church makes sense to me historically more than any other Christian faith. And also I appreciate how deep they go with things. Like one of the one of the pillars of world philosophy, multiple pillars of world philosophy were Catholic. Like, that's really fascinating to me. It's very deeply tied with intellectual pursuit at yeah, its best, yeah. at its best. So fascinating to me. The thing that I, I guess, have issues with right now are the right and the wrong. Because right and wrong, it is so easy to get into your mind. It is right to do this and it is wrong to do this. And it is so easy to bind yourself by the things that you tell yourself are right and that are wrong. Like if I start going to daily mass and then I miss daily mass, I will feel bad. Even though that like that's not that's not right or wrong. I'm just going to daily mass. Okay. But I'll feel bad as if I sinned. Um that's like, I think that that's dangerous. I don't think that's dangerous. Why? It's much better to feel bad about missing a daily mass than I just killed someone. You know, like th that's a muscle you've created over time. What about, what about a wife? So, you're so built up mm -hmm. spiritually and mentally mm -hmm. that you feel bad over missing a daily mass. Okay, what about a wife who's being beaten by her husband and is afraid to leave because she does not feel like it's the right thing to do? Extreme case, I know, but like sometimes you have to go to the extremes to actually- well, I get it, I get it. Yeah. But what, what do you, I, I don't really get what you're asking with that. Well, the Catholic Church says that it is right to stay with your husband, but also she feels, she hypothetical of course, but she feels the the commitment and she feels like it is her her- cross to bear but he, she she's getting beaten and like obviously it's not the right thing for her why isn't it the right thing for her well should she get beaten is her husband a good man no i think we got confused there about who are we talking about okay. i said why why isn't it the right thing i was referring to her staying 
Yeah, I, I don't think it's the right thing for her to stay with an abusive husband and in an abusive marriage. Okay, sure. I'm not saying I disagree with that. Yeah, but I think that there are ways- I don't think ways... the church would necessarily disagree with that either. No, I don't think so either, but I think there are ways that she could convince herself that it, it would be a good thing for her to stay. I think that's dangerous. The way that we can convince ourselves that something is is right and then we can feel bad for not doing something even though it's like- that's okay, just, actually, that's, that's conscious. That's just being, that's just being conscious. That has nothing to do with that. I mean, that has little to do with the Catholic church, regardless of what faith, this is interesting, regardless of what faith you believe, you're always going to have that knot in your stomach over something that, that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't, that doesn't just leave you because you joined a, that doesn't just leave you because you left a religion. No, you're right. You said something earlier and it and it kind of simmered for a second and then it came back up. You said that it makes a lot of sense that like you would rather be more good than less good, right? Like there's 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 okay, this is this is good and then somebody can go above and beyond or somebody can go below and beyond. Um right. You've developed yourself into thinking that missing daily mass is bad. You're probably doing pretty good compared to you know most people what is the level the, it's, like it's, do you it's think a better muscle to reach than i hey i just killed someone i just stole their i just stole their their wallet what do you think about people that believe that christian music is bad christian music yeah like it, it, it has come from a certain place and it's like it's not good I've never even heard that. I think Christian music is phenomenal. This. I think classical, <laughs> I think classical Catholic music is, is awesome. There are some, some really the, good ones. I think some of the new, I think some of the new stuff is, is not that good. Um, I, I think, think it, this, this is, con is controversial. Um, this is so bad. I'll say it anyways, though, because you bring out the best and the worst in me, Charlie. Okay. So basically I think that, some of the Christian music artists have become Christian music artists because they couldn't have made it otherwise. So then their stuff sucks. Based. Ass. <laughs> Based. I don't mind that. I but it works. I don't but, mind but, that take it all. I'm like, I don't want to be a butt, but like, they suck. Some I'm not, them. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not that deep into the, the Christian music scene. Neither uh, yeah. am I. But, the, but, but I've the, heard some stuff. I'm like. The, the classical wow. Catholic stuff that I hear at my church, which is pretty are you a latin school. music are you a latin no i'm not a latin no, <laughs> it says a lot about a person but i think those people are really special to be honest and That's it's hilarious. actually it's actually getting shut down here in chicago is so, it and mass from their uh That's bishop another thing speakers. how do you go about all of the the controversies within the church and like the split between the Eastern and Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism. What, how do you, how do you decipher that? What, what do you mean? I don't, so, I'm not, I'm not Eastern Orthodox. No, I know that, but the Catholic church split, split from one church into the Eastern Orthodox. And I believe it was, I don't remember if it was Vatican II or if it was, it was, it was one of the, one of the Vatican councils and they split because of the decisions made the bishops split okay so i'll i'll put it like this my favorite ice cream flavor is hello <laughs> that is ben and jerry's half baked <laughs> that is so just, be just because there's a lot of other ice cream flavors doesn't mean that i'm not going with ben and jerry's half baked uh, people love making this argument against catholicism is they say well why are there so many denominations with christianity i don't care about all the other denominations but the eastern orthodox keeps everything consistent except for this one vatican council's decision yeah and honestly i'm gonna be honest i don't i, I haven't looked into that nearly as much as i should but the the argument that really pisses me off is that everyone that just said oh there's a new split every other day like i'm not the one splitting i am staying with Ben and Jerry's half-baked Roman Catholic church. I understand that. Um, 
All right, final. What do you want our final topic to be? We can make this like five minutes. Give me a lightning round. What's my lightning round? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Are you ready for this? Why do you believe in a God? Ooh, well, that's not a lightning round question. That's like a, do you have the rest of my life question? (laughs) That's uh, I believe in a God because I believe that I I don't think there's, I, I don't think I need reason to believe that there's a God. I believe that he exists on its own. And I believe that's been laid out to me through my short time on earth so far. Interesting. I don't want to add too much, but um, it is interesting to me because like whenever I'm in different mindsets and whenever I highly, I guess. I have a really tough time listening to the atheist arguments and I used to listen to them, but now it's, been so evident within my own life Mm -hmm. and my own personal journeys that I I can't it's not not even they're not gonna get me on that it's not even the arguments for me because like I could I could listen to the arguments and then I have to go deeper what it is for me is whenever I take the philosophy and just like really really sit with it and really imagine and just like play out in my mind and in my day-to-day what it would be like to live like that nothing feels as good as Christianity. Like I don't interact with people well whenever I am nihilistic or whenever I don't believe that there's a God. I don't see, you know, the trees and the beauty as much whenever I don't believe that there's a God. And it's so strange how the way that you see the world is so impacted by what you believe in terms of philosophy. It's ridiculous. Okay. That was a great thought. Yeah. Um. Why do you care about freedom? Like, why do you care about, you know, this history stuff and doing this book and and making this a part of your life? Sure. Well, a big part of it was over COVID. I don't want to do that again. I don't want to be, I don't believe that another human being has the power to lock me into my house against my own will. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty simplistic argument, although I think it's a good one. And I would say for the greater society, I just am super pumped up. I think the most prosperous societies are the ones that are least into central planning. And I think the by far the least prosperous societies are the ones with the most central planning throughout history. So I'm I'm just super optimistic about the ability for humanity to come up with ideas that don't require force you could almost say that that's what they're that's what that's what happens with psychological warfare like there's this concept called psychological warfare where it's like unbeknownst to you you are being taught to do something that you don't actually consciously want to do you're just like kind of habitually being taught to do it um that's not forceful so then it's not just not forceful but it's also like I mean, in, in some senses, I guess, but it's not forceful. I think it is forcible. What, what, okay. Clarify what forceful is against your will. Not voluntary. Okay. So it's the law for me to go to, for example, let's just say it's the law for you to go to public education, mm-hmm. which it is. So you're sort of held against your will or your parents are being held against their will to send you to a a school, Mm -hmm. let's say the school can create the programming from there. Yeah. When do you start having rights? Like as a child, when, when, as a child, your parents can tell you something and can forcibly, I mean, people argue on this, but like for the argument's sake can forcibly, you know, teach you to do something, be like, Hey, don't do X, Y, Z. And, and that's not a bad thing, but when it, does it become the, hey, don't do that? Don't force this. That's a great question. I, I honestly wouldn't, the, people keep going back and forth on that. And I'm going to be honest, I don't have a good answer for that. Cool. Neither do I. Okay. Um, next question. What does it mean to you to be good? Mm. I believe to be good is to live out your purpose. Obviously we've been talking a lot about Christianity, carrying your cross, 
without interfering other people's missions as well. You say mission. Mission is a very like purpose. They're their do you think it's their end goal their end goal that doesn't interfere with mine their their hardships their their hardships that they choose so do they choose their end goal or is that bigger the hardships that they choose gotcha okay and last and final question let me make this a really really solid one whenever you consider in your mind the best version of you who are you? I love that question. The best version of me is someone who I can look back on the person, you know, I could watch, I could rewatch this interview and I could say, you know, that guy's, that guy's conquered some dragons since that last interview, that guy, he, he set out to do a bunch of things and he was able to get it done and he never, never sold himself up to gain popularity or to gain some status. He always kept true to himself and what he believed in. I think that's when I look back on myself and I could say that guy, you know, that guy's slayed some dragons and he's been through it. I think that's when, that's where I'm going to be. You never reach the best version of yourself, but you always want to keep getting better. So when I can look back and say those things, I'll be proud. Whenever you can look at yourself and be like, okay, mad respect. Nice yeah, job. exactly. Exactly. Just such a long, such a long journey. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, Charlie, this has been so much fun. It, it was, it was like, a, I don't know. We went back and forth on a lot of different topics. So thank you. Yeah, that was yeah. awesome. Hey, whenever you need a, uh, a plan B, you know, <laughs> you have a podcast during the week, you know, you, you got, you got an hour 30 to kill. I can, I hope I can, I hope the people enjoyed it. Everyone grab a twisted history of the United States. <laughs> I want to um, crowd donate to the crowdfunding site, July 4th. This book's going to make people free. All righty. Well, thank you, Charlie. Yep. I hope that you found this, this episode enriching. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you would like to write a rating or forward to our next episode. Cheers.